Hi, uh, my name is David Henry. I'm a professor of Japanese language and literature at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, Alaska. And one of the things I study is Japanese children's literature. Um, so today I would like to introduce um, three wonderful Japanese picture books for the U.S. elementary school classroom to you. Now, the books are Kami Shibai Man by Alan Say, The Wakame Gatherers by Holly Thompson, and finally, Faithful Elephants, a true story of animals, people, and war, originally written by Yukio Tsuchiya. And so I've picked these books for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, because they pre present really interesting, authentic insights into Japanese culture in the modern period. So into Japanese entertainment, into Japanese foodways, into uh, the continuing kind of connection to World War II and things like that. Um, I've also picked them, and, and probably most of all, just because they're good stories. They're beautifully drawn, they're really nicely uh, written, and they're absolutely engaging with children, you know, in the elementary school classroom. Most of these you could use from first through almost sixth grade. Um, so I'm not just a teacher, I'm a father. I have an eight-year-old uh, girl, um, and I've also read all of these stories with her, and she loves them all. So. You know, they're kid-tested and professor-approved. Um, now, for each of these three stories, I want to present three, three things primarily. Um, a short synopsis, so you know what the story is about. A little bit of uh, culture and history uh, that will be directly applicable to the classroom, so you can uh, fill that into with your students. And then finally, some guiding questions um, and activities. So just a couple of ideas. How could you actually use this in the elementary school classroom? So without further ado, let's start with Kami Shibai Man by Alan Say. Um, so Alan Say is a lovely, lovely illustrator. He's, uh, he was born in Yokohama, a Japanese man. Now he lives in Portland, Oregon. And he was born, I believe, in 1937. So he's quite old now, but he's, in the last 10, so, 10 or so years, he's done a lot of picture books. Um, and if you like this one, you know, I'd suggest look at some of the other ones, too. Um, so Kami Shibai is Japanese for paper theater. Um, so it's paper theater. And you can see here on the cover, um, you know, th there's a man with a bicycle. He has sweets and carts on the bicycle. And then he has um, his paper theater. So he's got a, a set of 10 to maybe a dozen paper cards that he can pull out one by one from that wooden frame and tell a story uh, to the assembled children around him. So Kamishiba, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, peaked in the 1930s and 1950s. And so this was a moment in Japan, especially in the cities of Tokyo, Osaka, Yokohama, um, where there were thousands, literally thousands of kamishibai men who would make their living by bicycling around from one neighborhood filled with children to another. Um, they would set up their bike. They would take wooden clappers, just like two little pieces of wooden two-by-four, and go clack, 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 clack. Uh, these were called uh, hyoshige, and it was a traditional way of gathering people's attention. Um, and so when children would hear this clack, 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 they knew that the kamishibai man was in their neighborhood. And so they would gather around the back of his bicycle, and first he would make his living by selling them sweets and candy. And so there would be sugar candy like we're used to, and then there would be more Japanese things like um, rice crackers, little crunchy rice crackers, sometimes with flavors like green tea or milk, um, which sounds odd to us, but I guess it's good, milk powdered uh, rice crackers, or even things like dried squid, uh, which is actually much better than it sounds. And so after they had uh, sold just you know little sweets to the assembled children, just for pocket money, um, they would launch into three or four different kamishibai. Uh, so one kamishibai would be one story, um, on the, in the picture here, we have Momotaro, or the Peach Boy, which is the story um, you see in the picture there. Um, and so you would take um, maybe one or two minutes for each of those uh, paper cards, and then you would pull it out and reveal the next uh, paper card and the next element of the story. And so a total Kamishibai performance would go anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Um, you know, so one individual story might be 10 or 15 minutes, and there would be maybe a set of three stories. Uh, so usually the first one um, might be a comedy, kind of slapstick, something that kids would enjoy. Um, 
And then the second one might be more pitched at girls, uh, a melodrama with a hero and heroine um, and emotionally engaging details. And then the last one, the third one, would often be um, an action adventure or science fiction. Some of the earliest um, superheroes actually came out of the kami shibai um, uh, genre. And so they would tell these, you know, these three stories. And then at the end, um, oftentimes they would have a quiz. And so, you know, if this, if the boys and girls could answer that question correctly, then they would get a, maybe an extra piece of candy for free. Um, so it may sound surprising to us, but you could actually make a good living in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s doing this. Um, a lot of it depended on the skill of the storyteller. You know, so Japan has a long tradition of commingled, uh, storytelling arts where you have words and pictures, or you have, uh, for example, Benshi, B-E-N-S-H-I, where you have a, a black and white silent picture, and then you have a movie storyteller who gives you the story uh, while you're watching the movie. And actually, in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, before sound came to movie uh, motion pictures, people would often pick the motion picture based on the Benshi, the movie storyteller, rather than the motion picture, because... The Benchy really made it come alive. And the same is true with Kami Shibai. Um, a good Kami Shibai storyteller adds sound effects. They might pull the card halfway out to build tension. Um, you know, they'll accentuate different parts of the picture. Um, and, and so people who are good at this could make as much as a teacher, even a high school principal. So the 1930s was the peak of it. It dropped off during the 1940s, and then it picked up again after 1945. Um, where it just exploded, and then it kind of started to die off after 1952 with the introduction of TV. And so TV really did kill, um, after a few years, Kami Shibai. Um, but it had a good run. During the 1950s, this is our second bullet point, roughly 10,000 Kami Shibai men performed daily and actually made a decent living by storytelling. Now, for resources, I really suggest you check out uh, kamishibai.com. So the best online resource is www.kamishibai.com, uh, where you can find Kamishibai packets and articles, uh, including a really readable and very short, it's like five or six pages, article called What is Kamishibai by Jeffrey Dim, uh, who's a Japanese history professor. There's also many good examples on YouTube, including um, What is Kamishibai, uh, by user Dem Sensei, which is also Jeffrey Dem. If you want to look at books, there's a good book by Eric Nash out called Manga Kamishibai, The Art of Japanese Paper Theater, um, which is useful especially for its primary resources. It has a lot of these old Kamishibai um, series, like uh, Ogon Bato, The Golden Bat, or uh, Prince of uh, Gamma, which is an early superhero science fiction uh, story. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do with Kami Shibai. Um, one of the most natural things to do, and we've done this, I've done this uh, with my daughter's elementary school, um, is kind of a one, two, three, where number one, um, you bring in the, the Kami Shibai book and read that. Um, then number two, you can actually buy Kami Shibai packets, so you could do a Kami Shibai uh, with your students. And then number three, um, you could actually have them make their own Kami Shibai. And you might take it not up to a dozen slides, but maybe force them to kind of condense it down into four or five um, pictures and tell a story that way. So it's it's a really engaging means of storytelling. Um, I kind of skipped over the synopsis. So I want to start with the book uh, by just reading you the first page. Not so long ago in Japan, in a small house on a hillside, there lived an old man and his wife. Even though they never had children of their own, they called each other Ji-chan and Ba-chan. Ji-chan is grandpa, and Ba-chan is grandma. One day, Ba-chan said, Ji-chan, you haven't said a word in three days. Um, I've been thinking how much I miss going on my rounds, he said. Ba-chan stared. How many years has it been, she asked. Hmm, yes, quite a while, but my legs are good, and I've kept the bicycle in good order. I don't know, but one day won't hurt, I suppose. Should I make some candies? That would be very nice, Di Chan said. So this is the beginning of our story, which is um, very much cast in a nostalgic mode, um, where a man who made his living as a kamishibai man uh, back in the 50s 
now is much older and the kind of market for Kamishibai has passed, but he decides in his old age to go out one more time and make the rounds. So he goes into the town and the town has changed, but he gathers not children this time, but adults who are nostalgic for his stories. Um, and so he tells them one of his stories. And then in a kind of uh, reflective ending, he goes back at, that night and he's going to tell his his wife, uh, Bachan, how well it went, but she already knows because it turns out he was on the evening news as a kind of human interest piece. And so it's a story that's Kamishibai man. It's very reflective about uh, media and how we tell stories through different media. And this gets into the guiding questions. So, you know, the first question, how do we tell stories? Um, it helps, you know, our students think about that, especially if they make Kamishibai themselves. What are they going to picture? What is the essential that they're going to be able to boil down to? So, and still tell the story in four or five pictures. And then number two, does the media we tell stories through change the media? And I think this is a fascinating one for us because we're moving from paper books to digital books. We're moving from analog to digital. Certainly our students have, you know, any variety of screen time that they can, uh, you know, take up stories through. And so it's nice to kind of reflect on that and, and also to kind of slow us down in this digital age. Um, with Kamishibai, what happens is the students are forced to linger on each picture for one or two or even three minutes. And so it really lets them slow down and take a different relationship, take a more in-depth relationship to the image um, and be guided through just one image that moves, not through technology, but through the words of the storyteller. Uh, yeah, so Kamishibai Man is a wonderful, wonderful book and also a kind of wonderful practice to try out in your elementary school classroom. Uh, the second book is called The Wakame Gatherers uh, by Holly Thompson, illustrated by Kazumi Wilds. Um, and first of all, I, I think it's a wonderful book to include in the elementary school classroom because it's just beautifully illustrated. Um, it's got these um, deep blues and rich greens, and you can almost smell the, you know, the ocean air when you, when you read it. And, and the text, the prose, is also quite lovely um, by Holly Thompson. So... Um, as a way of introducing it, I'm going to read the, the first page to you from the Wakame Gatherers. My name is Nanami, Seven Seas, and I have two grandmothers from two different seas, Graham from Maine and Bachan, who lives with us here in Japan. Bachan's town, my town, rims a bay with sandy beaches and surfers. A streetcar runs between shops, houses, temples, and shrines, and near our home, is a harbor where fishing families hang seaweed and set racks of fish to dry. Grahamstown in Maine surrounds a bay with rocky shores, quiet with woods. I visit in summers and swim in the cold Atlantic. At low tide, the rocks are seaweed shaggy with green crabs hiding beneath. Sometimes we pull lobster traps in the bay and seals poke their heads up to study us. So this is just a, the prose is really rich and lovely and kind of pulls you through this beautifully illustrated story um, of Nanami, who is a bicultural child. She has her uh, American grandmother, Graham, from Maine, who's in the picture. She's on the left in the red, and then Bachan in blue on the right. And so in the story, uh, Graham from Maine comes to join her in Japan, um, and Nanami translates back and forth for her two uh, grandmothers, American and Japanese, um, and they decide one day to go out into the harbor and gather wakame, which is one of several kinds of uh, edible seaweed, which is delicious. And at the kind of emotional height of the story, um, you know, Nanami is having a wonderful time gathering seaweed, and she said to her old grandmothers, when you were young like me, did you have braids that you would whip around? And they said, yes, we did, Nanami. And she said, did you go out and collect seaweed, you know, when you were young? And they said, yes, we did, Nanami. And then she said, did you have nice blue, you know, um, pants, you know, for gathering seaweed like I did? And the two grandmothers look at each other, and they're brought back to, you know, when they were young, and, and the country was at war, and so there wasn't enough clothes, there wasn't enough food. And Bachan says, you know, since no toki da to it was wartime, and so things were different. And Nanami realizes that her two grandmothers, you know, their countries were at war with one another. Um, and so there's a kind of serious moment where we're linked from this beautiful moment of peace back to the war. And then, you know, 
she says, well, I'm sorry to her American grandmother and gomen, ne? gomen nasai to her, her Japanese bachan. And then they're kind of brought back to this moment of peace. And it's made all the more wonderful by the realization that, you know, the two halves of her family are whole and, um, and together. And then at the end, actually, um, we, we get a letter that comes to uh, Nanami's Japanese grandmother inviting her to go to Maine. Uh, and so presumably in the future, the kind of circuit will be completed and the Japanese grandmother will go to America. Um, a lot of the really lovely things about these book, this book is the details that you see, not always the first time, but maybe at the second reading. So the end papers that have these lovely different seaweed illustrations. Um, also at the end, there's little pictures, presumably like snapshots of when Bachan goes to Maine. So we can kind of extrapolate out. Um, there's two really nice features at the end as well. One is a set of recipes. Um, you know, for using seaweed in, in Japanese cuisine. And with your class, you can actually make uh, miso soup with seaweed, which is super easy to make. If you have an Asian grocery store um, anywhere near you, you'll be able to get that. Uh, these days, I think you can even get it at a Safeway or a, you know, a traditional American grocery store. Um, so you can make those recipes with your class. They're super easy to do. There's also a glossary with phonetic pronunciations for the Japanese words. Um, so it's a nice way to kind of introduce the language arts and introduce Japanese words like wakame, ba-chan, daijobu, mottainai. Um, and the book gather, gives you a phonetic pronunciation, so it's very easy to do. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, I need to move the slide forward. Uh, so the wakame gathers, you know, it touches on themes of number one family. So we have the two grandmothers, one in Maine, one in Kamakura which is a, a city just a little bit south of Tokyo on the ocean, on the main island of Honshu. Um, and, you know, Nanami is biculturist. She's a, a Japanese-American girl. And for most of us, our students have a diversity in their own families that, you know, they can explore. Uh, number two, it touches on history. So both grandmothers remember uh, wartime. Um, and in the case of Bachan, remembers being bombed. You know, so um, World War II, there wasn't just... Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atomic bombings, they were um, actually the, the greatest loss of life during a bombing in World War II was um, the, the bombing of uh, uh, late spring 1945 of Tokyo, the uh, Tokyo Daikushu, the great Tokyo air raid, which killed over 100,000 people, more than either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Uh, number three, you can touch on language. So the story uses several Japanese words, includes a glossary, as I mentioned. And then number four, I think the most fun about this is probably food. Um, specifically, food is a cultural heritage. So uh, the different ways that uh, cultures use food, like seaweed. You know, seaweed suggests something that you would try to get rid of, whereas kaiso, you know, in Japanese, it's sea grass. So guiding questions for this would be, number one, what is our own ethnic and or national heritage? Number two, how does this heritage express itself in food? And number three, what recipes are distinct to our own families? Um, so a fun way to use this book is say, well, okay, we've got Nanami's, you know, recipe from her gram and her bacha. How about your own family? Do you have recipes that are not just from your family, but reflect a kind of national or ethnic heritage? Okay, moving on to the last story, um, Faithful Elephants, a true story of animals, people, and war by Yukio Tsuchiya, Tsuchiya is um, certainly the most powerful charged story. Um, and it's a story of during the war in 1943, when um, the zoo officials decided they had to kill the animals because if the zoo was broken during uh, air raids, then they might escape and hurt people. This is probably not a story for younger children, for first and second grade graders, but for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, it's an extremely powerful way to kind of consider the war. Um, so it's based on a historical event from 1943 called the Great Ueno Zoo Massacre. And I want to briefly introduce it um, uh, from a book called The Nature of Beasts, Empire and Exhibition at the Tokyo Imperial Zoo uh, by the uh, Harvard scholar Ian Miller. So he writes, the most disturbing thing that ever happened at the Ueno Zoo was the systematic slaughter of the garden's most famous and valuable animals in the summer of 1943. At the height of the Second World War, as the Japanese Empire teetered at the brink of collapse, the zoo was transformed from a wonderland of imperial amusement and exotic curiosity into a carefully ritualized abattoir, a public altar for the sanctification of creatures sacrificed in the service of total war and of ultimate surrender to the emperor and nation. The cult of military martyrdom is often recognized as a central component of Japanese fascist culture, but events at the zoo 
um, add a chilling new dimension to that um, analysis. And so um, this book tells the story of this massacre. Um, and so the Ueno Zoo in downtown Tokyo is the oldest, biggest zoo in Japan. It's still there today. Um, and it was tremendously popular. Um, even during the war period, you know, people could get a break from the war by going to see lions, tigers, bears, and especially the three elephants, which are the most popular attraction. Um, but in early 1943, the, the officials decided they had to kill the animals. Um, and so they killed lions, tigers, bears, uh, big snakes, and eventually all three elephants. Now, because at first this was carried out clandestinely, uh, because they didn't want to alarm the populace, they couldn't use guns or rifles. Um, and so they were poisoned, starved, strangled, sometimes beaten to death. Um, it was really a terrible thing. And the three elephants were the last because they were the biggest, they were the hardest to kill. They were also the most beloved. So the three elephants that were starved were John, Tonky, and Wanley. And uh, this book tells the story of, of how those three elephants were killed. Um, John was a male elephant and actually fairly aggressive. Um, in 1931, he actually gored to death with his tusk, uh, a zookeeper. And so they decided to kill John first. Um, at first, they gave him sweet potatoes laced with strychnine. But whether the elephants could smell the poison or they could tell from the emotional cues from the zookeepers, they didn't eat it. Um, and so then they tried to take a syringe with poison and inject it into John, but his, his high, his thick leathery elephant skin was too tough, and so they just kept breaking off. So finally they just starved him to death. And so when they stopped giving him food and water, it was 17 days, from August 13th to August 29th. Um, and finally John succumbed. Um, then they moved on to Tonki and Wanley, who were female elephants and even more beloved, um, and so it was much harder. So I'll read you one quick passage uh, from the middle of the book. All this while, the elephant's trainer loved them as if they were his own children. He could only pace in front of the cage and moan, you poor, poor, pitiful elephants. One day, Tonki and Wanley lifted their heavy bodies, staggered to their feet, and came close to their trainer. Squeezing out what little strength they had left, Tonki and Wanley made their appeal. They stood on their hind legs and lifted their front legs up as high as they could. Then, raising their trunks high in the air, they did their bonsai trick. Surely their friend would reward them with food and water, as he used to do. And so, and even as you can see right now, I'm misting up a little bit. And when I read this with my daughter, we, we always cry. Um, because the zookeepers had to walk by these animals day after day, and the animals were reaching out with their trunks, doing tricks, trying anything. They didn't know why they were being starved to death. Um, another reason why they couldn't use rifles is because there's a kind of political element to this. And this isn't brought out directly in the story. But the background is that um, you know the population of Japan at this point in 1943 knew the war was going badly, saw Tokyo you know, start to get bombed. Um, or at least they knew it would be bombed shortly. Um, and so they realized that they might have to make the ultimate sacrifice too. There was not enough food. Uh, they might have to fight to the death. And so to shoot the animals would suggest that they were enemies, which they were not. Uh, but to starve them to death would suggest that they were innocent victims who were giving their all. Um, and in that sense, they could be a model for the Japanese people. Um, you know, so this is a very powerful story. Um, if you use it with, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth graders, they're never going to forget it. Um, but, but, you know, think about if they're capable of handling it. Um, the Ueno Zoo in Tokyo is still Japan's most famous zoo. And even today, there's a monument to the elephants who were um, indirect victims of World War II, and people leave uh, folded paper cranes there. I think this is a wonderful book to use, even though it is powerful, um, because it gives us these guiding questions. Number one, what are the indirect effects of war? both in the story and in the U.S. And it's really nice because there's no political posturing. It doesn't take, it doesn't say, oh, war is good or war is bad. But it said this is one of the effects of war. For a lot of the students in elementary school right now, they've never known the United States as a country at peace. Um, Afghanistan is our longest war in our history. Uh, we're pulling out, but we're still fighting it. And so for most elementary school, they've never known the United States at a time when we weren't fighting a war. Um, and yet, it seems like it doesn't have a big impact on us. So I think this is a great story to say, how does war affect us? You know, if, 
Uh, maybe they have friends who have served overseas and have come home to their families or families who are separated. Or, so it kind of opens up that discussion in a non-judgmental way. Uh, number two, what is our relationship to animals? Because kids love animals, um, and stories with animals are really appealing, and certainly this one is, is very powerful, um, and a way to think about how do we treat animals? Uh, why do we eat some animals and, and have other animals as pets? Well, I better stop here, but I really appreciate your time and, and your listening, and I hope that you can use one, two, or even all three of these stories with your students. Um, I know they're going to love them. Um, and I hope this is useful for you. So thank you very much.